Chapter twenty three of Penrod. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Jonathan Burchard, April two thousand nine. Penrod by Booth Tarkington. Chapter twenty three. Colored Troops in Action. How neat and pure is the task of the chronicler who has the tale to tell of a good rousing fight between boys or men who fight the good old English way, according to a model set for fights in books long before Tom Brown went to rugby. There are seconds and rounds and rules of fair play, and always there is a good feeling in the end, though sometimes, to vary the model, the butcher defeats the hero, and the chronicler who stencils this fine old pattern on his page is certain of applause as a stirrer of red blood there is no surer recipe. But when Herman and Vermin set to, to the record must be no more than a few fragments left by the expurgator. It has been perhaps sufficiently suggested that the altercation in Mr. Schofield's stable opened with mayhem in respect to the aggressor's nose. Expressing vocally his indignation and, and the extremity of his pained surprise, Mr. Collins stepped backwards, holding his left hand over his nose and striking at Herman with his right. Then Vermin hit him with the rake. Vermin struck from behind. He struck as hard as he could, and he struck with the tines down, for in his simple, direct African way he wished to kill his enemy, and he wished to kill him as soon as possible. That was his single, earnest purpose. On this account, Rupe Collins was peculiarly unfortunate. He was plucky and he enjoyed conflict, but neither his ambitions nor his anticipations had ever included murder. He had not learned that an habitually aggressive person runs the danger of colliding with beings in one of those lower stages of evolution wherein theories about hitting below the belt have not yet made their appearance. The rake glanced from the back of Roop's head to his shoulder, but it felled him. Both darkies jumped full upon him instantly, and the three rolled and twisted upon the stable floor, unloosing upon the air sincere maledictions closely connected with complaints of cruel and unusual treatment while certain expressions of feeling presently emanating from Herman and Vermin indicated that Rupe Collins, in this extremity, was proving himself not too slavishly addicted to fighting by rule. Dan and Duke, mistaking all for mirth, barked gaily. From the panting, pounding, yelling heap issued words and phrases hitherto quite unknown to Penrod and Sam. Also, a hoarse repetition in the voice of Rupe concerning his ear left it not to be doubted that additional mayhem was taking place. Appalled, the two spectators retreated to the doorway nearest the yard, where they stood dumbly watching the cataclysm. The struggle increased in primitive simplicity. Time and again the howling Rupe got to his knees only to go down again as the earnest brothers, in their own way, assisted him to a more reclining position. Primal forces operated here, and the two blanched, slightly higher products of evolution, Sam and Penrod, no more thought of interfering than they would have thought of interfering with an earthquake. At last, out of the ruck rose Vermin, disfigured and maniacal. With a wild eye he looked about him for his trusty rake. But Penrod, in horror, had long since thrown the rake out into the yard. Naturally it had not seemed necessary to remove the lawnmower. The frantic eye of Vermin fell upon the lawnmower, and instantly he leaped to his handle. Shrilling a wordless war cry, he charged, propelling the whirling, deafening knives straight across the prone legs of Rupe Collins. The lawnmower was sincerely intended to pass longitudinally over the body of Mr. Collins from heel to head, and it was the time for a death song. Black Valkyrie hovered in the shrieking air. Cut his gizzard out! shrieked Herman, urging on the whirling knives. They touched and lacerated the shin of Roop as, with the supreme agony of effort a creature in mortal peril puts forth before succumbing, he tore himself free of Herman and got upon his feet. Herman was up as quickly. He leaped to the wall and seized the garden scythe that hung there. "'I'm going to cut your gizzard out,' he announced definitely, "'and eat it!' Roop Collins had never run from anybody, except his father, in his life. He was not a coward, but the present situation was very, very unusual." He was already in a badly dismantled condition, and yet Herman and Vermin seemed discontented with their work. Vermin was swinging the grass-cutter about for a new charge, apparently still wishing to mow him, and Herman made a quite plausible statement about what he intended to do with the scythe. Root paused but for an extremely condensed survey of the horrible advance of the brothers, and then, uttering a blood-curdling scream of fear, ran out of the stable and up the alley at a speed he had never before attained. 
so that even Dan had hard work to keep within barking distance. And a cross-shoulder glance at the corner revealed Vermin and Herman in pursuit, the latter waving his scythe overhead. Mr. Collins slackened not his gait, but rather, out of great anguish, increased it. The while a rapidly developing purpose became firm in his mind, and ever after so remained, not only to refrain from visiting that neighborhood again, but never by any chance to come within a mile of it. From the alley door, Penrod and Sam watched the flight, and were without words. When the pursuit rounded the corner, the two looked wanly at each other, but neither spoke until the return of the brothers from the chase. Herman and Vermin came back, laughing and chuckling. hi yi cackled Herman to Vermin as they came. See that old boy run? Hooey! Vermin shouted in ecstasy. Nev did see boy run so fast, Herman continued, tossing the scythe into the wheelbarrow. I bet he home in bed by this time. Vermin roared with delight, appearing to be wholly unconscious that the lids of his right eye were swollen shut and that his attire, not too finical before the struggle, now entitled him to unquestioned rank as a sans culotte. Herman was a similar ruin and gave as little heed to his condition. Penrod looked dazedly from Herman to Vermin and back again. So did Sam Williams. Herman, said Penrod in a weak voice, you wouldn't honest have cut his gizzard out, would you? Who? Me? I don't know. He might have mean old boy. Herman shook his head gravely, and then, observing that Vermin was again convulsed with unctuous merriment, joined laughter with his brothers. Sho! Sure, I guess I is just talkin' when's I said that. Reckon he thought I meant it from the way he tuck and run. Hi yi! Reckon he thought old Herman bad man. No, sir, I is just talkin', cause I never would cut nobody. I ain't tryin' get in no jail. No, sir. Penrod looked at the scythe. He looked at Herman. He looked at the lawnmower and he looked at Vermin. Then he looked out in the yard at the rake. So did Sam Williams. Come on, Vermin, said Herman. We ain't got that stove wood for supper yet. Giggling reminiscently, the brothers disappeared, leaving silence behind them in the carriage house. Penrod and Sam retired slowly into the shadowy interior, each glancing now and then with a preoccupied air at the open, empty doorway where the late afternoon sunshine was growing ruddy. At intervals, one or the other scraped the floor reflectively with the side of his shoe. Finally, still without either having made any effort at conversation, they went out into the yard and stood, continuing their silence. Well, said Sam at last, I guess it's time I better be getting home. So long, Penrod. So long, Sam, said Penrod feebly. With a solemn gaze, he watched his friend out of sight. Then he went slowly into the house and after an interval occupied in a unique matter, appeared in the library holding a pair of brilliantly gleaming shoes in his hand. Mr. Schofield, reading the evening paper, glanced frowningly over it at his offspring. Look, Papa, said Penrod, I found your shoes where you'd taken them off in your room to put on your slippers, and they were all dusty, so I took them out on the back porch and gave them a good blacking. They shine up fine, don't they? Well, I'll be d d d dumb," said the startled Mr. Schofield. Henrod was zigzagging back to normal. End of chapter 23